Right then, it is Monday, it is 7 o'clock, and this is take number 8754 of Drift Crash. So on this week's episode, what we're going to talk about is drift technique, um, more specifically Japanese drift technique. But to get to that point, there's a few things that we need to run through first. In 2003, some 30 years after the inception of drifting, Keiichi Tsuchiya created something called the Drift Bible. The information in the Drift Bible are still the fundamentals and basics of drifting today. So let's quickly run through them. Forewarning, there will be a lot of kung fu hands in this video. The side brake, uh, the handbrake, the wand, the shtick, the hydra, whatever you want to call it, that thing on your possibly left or right, depending where you're from, that you pull and locks the rear wheels. Shift lock, power over, axle off. Braking drift, you faint, it's still on YouTube. I'll stick a link in the description so you can have a look at that. And it's in English nowadays, so you can, you can get the most out of it. Now bear in mind, that's 17 years ago. And I think, personally, that that's the point where the split between East and West really started to begin. And what it all boils down to, um, which may seem slightly controversial or not, depending on which way you're inclined, uh, is the welded differential. So the reason for that is that in the early 2000s, getting a limited slip differential for your Japanese car from the other side of the world was quite expensive. You're talking spending a thousand pounds, a couple of thousand dollars, about 25,000 Australian dollars, a welder differential was massively cheaper. You could spend a lot less money and get a similar result, or so we thought at the time. Now, the first thing to do is understand how a uh, welded differential works and how a limit slip differential works. Um, I am gonna reference you now to another YouTube channel uh, called Engineering Explained. I'm gonna put a link in the description. So any of you that don't understand the basics of how a diff works, how toe works, how camber works, how KBI and SAI and all these other uh, crazy things work. Basically, learn all of those things before you're going to really get any benefit from listening to this information channel thing, whatever the hell I'm doing. So, a limited slip differential. What happens is, is that when you apply power to the car, the wheels will lock and spin at the same speed to a certain degree. And when you decelerate, they will lock but it will be uh, to a lesser extent. You can, on more modern diffs and more expensive diffs, adjust how hard they lock and at what rate they lock. So you've got control over the slip between the wheels on and off power. Uh, additionally, if you put your foot in the clutch, the wheels are then unlocked. So what it means is that you have a lot more control over what the wheels are doing at any given point in a drift. So when you have a welded diff, what happens is that the wheels will turn at the same speed no matter what happens. So on throttle, off throttle, or even with the clutch in, that axle is always locked. Those wheels are spinning at the same speed because it's one complete unit. That effect, when you turn into a corner, will make you understeer because the rear wheels are driving you forwards. When you are drifting and you're on counter steer, you have to keep that real axle spinning because there's no slip. If you stop the axle spinning, the car will straighten or it will start push under steering as you grip up. You have to overpower it. That's just how it works. Now, I'm not saying that one way is better than the other. Settings, technique, and driver skill are all very separate things. Uh, it's important to avoid the word style. And the reason for that is, is that I believe style is just a a byproduct of having very good line, very good technique, and very good settings. Focus on actual driving skill. So I think if you boil down the differences in East versus West, initially, uh, obviously those differences come from the different types of tracks that we have and the different types of car setups that we have. In the West, I think um, we tend to use a word quite often um, which sort of summarizes our approach, which is making something optimal. I have to build my car to the highest level I can before I go drifting, because that will make me drift better. A good reflection of this that you can sort of see yourselves if you walk into a pit in the Western world tends to be about your car setup and what dampers you're running and what tires you're running and what pressure they're at, etc., etc. Um, whereas if you go to Japan and you go into the pits, people will ask about your line and uh, your initiation point 
and how you're slowing down and was I quick enough or slow enough or enough angle. As a side note, it's also worth mentioning that that could just be down to the environment. Any given day of the week in Japan, I can go to a, a, a drift circuit and go and have a few laps or um, if I'm a bit more of a naughtier boy, I can go to the mountains and I can go drifting any day, any night of the week. It's not a problem if you know what you're doing and where to go and um, hopefully you're doing it safely because, uh, you know, I have to sort of say that so I'm not liable. The point is you have a lot more access to be able to go and drift whereas in the western world it's much more of a pain in the backside you can go street drifting but um generally these days it's a horrible idea because there's going to be helicopters and cars and if you are going to go out and do that stuff i'm not condoning it but definitely don't film it come on it's 2020 use your brain final factor is that in places like norway for example it's kind of cold as hell and dark for months at a time so there's not a lot you can do outside i think japanese drifting and western drifting have both developed in their own right and they're different things at this stage but saying one is better than the other or this guy is better than that guy i mean if for me the best two drivers in the world right now one is james dean very clearly the other is naoki nakamura and they're both incredibly skilled, incredibly talented drivers doing very different things. So a massive factor for the Japanese setup is jacking. Um, by jacking, I mean that you're lifting the front of the car and sending weight to the back of the car. So the way you do that is obviously, you know, through the uh, suspension setup. So you'll put it slightly arse down when you set it up, you know, just a smidge, but that's enough because it'll transfer the weight easier. Um, and then you do things like increase the scrub radius. So, you know, if the, the wheel normally sits here, you move the wheel further out so that it's got more of a sort of uh, wider sweep of rotation. Um, Japanese cars now tend to run a lot of camber, you know, seeing eight, 10, 12 degrees front camber is fairly normal at this point because you're using that effect of, of the roll onto camber to do quite a few different things. Uh, one of them is to basically, um, so say we're going into Mayhan and I've, I've flicked into Mayhan and I'm, I'm I'm the car, this is the way we're going, uh, but you flicked into Mayhan and obviously this trailing wheel, as you come onto lock, there's gonna be a lot, a lot of camber there, which means that you don't have a, um, a biting point, which is effectively going to, to dig in and rotate the car and make you spin out. So there's a lot of adjustment over the Ackerman and the Ackerman sweep, which is done through modifying the knuckles, um, but there's not a lot in terms of uh, roll center a lot of people use the word correction, but I use adjustment because nothing, there's no one particular thing that is correct. So it's a roll center adjustment and Japanese don't use any because they want that effect. So the other key point to the Japanese setup is the ability to squat and then stay squatted. Throw the car in and the rear end squatted when you're on power as you launch it in. But then as you lift off power, because of that jacking effect, because you're still on lock, the grip stays at the back of the car and it will stay at the back of the car until you do something like brake and send the weight forwards, which means you can brake and rotate and create more angle, or you can brake and use a handbrake and sort of um, slow down very, very quickly by keeping the brake balance there. And that's why the Japanese like the sort of standard drum brake because you can brake and have a normal braking effect on the front but then you can add additional braking power on the rear when you do have a welded diff actually you tend to use a stronger hydraulic handbrake simply because it takes more force to stop two wheels than it does to stop the one leading wheel the level there of technique has become so high that line is no longer relevant because pretty much everybody you know can hit the line and do the same thing so then the details become important and little details mean that you have to drive in a very particular way for it to be on trend exciting or seen as high level how do we refer to japanese drifting well there's uh, a few different um, ways of talking about japanese drifting and the first two you probably all know is tanso and twiso which is tanso which is the single run and Twiso, which is the twin run or the, the battle. Uh, you then have something called Dantai, which is basically uh, team drifting. Normally three to five cars is Dantai. You then have something called the Super Dantai, which is basically 
Um, you'll all have seen Kansai All Stars, I'm sure. So Super Dantai is at the end of the day when all of the competition and everything is done, and they basically say, "There's a circuit. Anyone who qualified, you all go nuts now." When you're running in Tanso or Twiso or whatever it is, there's various types of line that facilitate that. So you've got something called a Dozo line, which is Dozo literally means uh, here you go. So if you're going to give somebody I don't know, a cup of tea, you go dozo. It literally means an open line, it's open to attack, and it's basically like saying, here is my door, please make use of it. You then have other types of lines which are for multiples of cars. So if you have three, four, five, six, seven, ten, twenty cars, the line has to vary. A friend of mine called Mizunaga from Tetsujin, there's a flag behind me somewhere, taught me something which is called the third car rule. Now the third car rule basically means that any third car in a drift train has no line. So as an example, go and have a look at a few videos online and look where the third car ends up. Now a very skillful driver as the third car can put himself in position, but what it does is that resets. So every third car, so you got the first car, second car, third car, third car no line, fourth car, fifth car, sixth car also has no line so it works at every third car and then everybody else is all right so that's what we call the third car rule and i think it's pretty useful so you do then get regional styles uh, for example the yokohama kanagawa style used to be that you'd run nose to tail so you'd uh, you'd stay behind the driver that you were chasing and then you'd have things like um, aichiken uh, mie gifu nara all that sort of area would be door to door you know you'd run on the door of people some places on the wheel some places it's cool to change direction at funny times obviously uh, in the western world all we tend to get is the version where you see it d1 where they're trying to get on the door and that's d1's version of drifting but it's not necessarily all versions of drifting and not applies uh, you know it doesn't necessarily apply to um, street style or just people on a circuit having fun and enjoying driving together you know they all have little things that they uh, enjoy doing. I feel this is a very critical point uh, to un understand something um, called Sanpatsu. Now, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard the word Sanpatsu on the internet. San meaning three, Patsu meaning motion, but Sanpatsu doesn't necessarily mean a manji up a straight. Now, the three motion drift is the fundamental basis of Japanese drifting. So it's the way that um, Japanese drifting creates timing that all drivers can follow. So how do we break the Sampatsu down? Now, the easiest way to look at it is that it's a hop, a step, and a jump. You know, like a if you imagine a hop, step, and a jump that you would do in a playground, the hop is sort of a, a medium distance, the step is a small distance, and the jump is a long distance. Now, as you come onto the straight at Mayhan, you're already in drift. This is the hop. So you come onto the straight with your rear right spring loaded. And before that car completely straightens off, you turn in again and you load up that rear right spring massively. Now what that then does is as you come off the power and clutch kick to change direction, is use all of the force of that spring to snap the car into a direction change. Now that direction change rotates you but it's actually to send you forward. So you're using that spring power to snap you forward. So the idea is not that you're necessarily um, changing direction, it's that you're changing direction in a very small space, but the car is still maintaining a massive forward motion. In turn, there are additional techniques that you need to master to be able to create the snapping force, to create that spring motion that you want for that massive, violent, sharp entry. The whole point is that that setup shows the driver behind you where you're loading the spring so that his timing can exactly match yours. There's a big difference in direction changes happening out of sync and direction changes happening together, which is the ultimate goal is that you want to snap into Mayhem the exact same time and end up in the right place and obviously for the chase car you've got to come over and sit behind the lead car slightly as well as you do it so that you're on the right line so it's quite tricky in that sense so the two things to master are initially something called korogashi and korogashi literally means rolling the easiest way to recognize that and, and what you will have 
all seen by now is Naoki Nakamura's throttle technique. Grip, 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 grip. Very much dancing on the very edge of just about drifting, but not overpowering the wheels. And that's because, going back to earlier in the video, he has the ability to adjust that because he's got a limited slip differential. So the Western equivalent with a fixed rear axle would mean that you've got to carefully balance the throttle on the way out of the corner, which sounds very different. So the detail of the throttle work is very different because you've got to apply the throttle in a different way. The reason Nauki can generate so much grip onto the Mayhan straight is because he has the ability to adjust how much that diff is locking because he is working on the actual lock rate of the diff. So as he comes off throttle, he's slightly unlocking and he goes back on, he's locking and unlocking and locking and unlocking. All of those little subtle changes create a huge amount of traction. So that's why the Japanese, when you hear their throttle work, it's very sharp, it's very quick, it's very punchy because there's lots of adjustments being made. What comes next is Tobashi. Now, Tobashi, the literal translation means skipping. However, a better way to understand it would be forward snapping. The motion between the step and the jump is what's known as Tobashi. So it's using the spring power to snap the car forwards and rotate at high speed simultaneously. So the way that works is, is obviously in the second motion, uh, the step is where you turn in on your drift and load up the rear right spring. What you're also doing is jacking the front up, increasing that even more, but you're forcing grip into the lead tire. So what that then does is create bite in that front tire that as you lift and the weight starts to come slightly forward, the force of that spring will then grab the floor and drag the car forwards from the front whilst shooting it forwards from that rear right spring as well. And that snapping force, that energy that's created from the springs is known as Tobashi. And the way I actually learned the word, just as a weird sort of tangent, is a guy once said to me, Nanigan Tobashi Tonja. Like it means, it would almost mean like, what the hell are you uh, like directly going towards? But that's how to interpret the drift element of Tobashi is that you're snapping yourself directly at a point. The timing of it is critical so that that's why you load up the car in that way. You come onto the straight, tuck in and snap together. It's three motions that become one drift. So the first motion and the second motion are setting up the timing for the actual drift, the third motion. God, I hope this video makes sense. <laughs> Another useful word is frikai, which literally means flick. Uh, faint is its own separate word, faint or, um, but furikai is very much where you uh, change from the second motion to the third and that flicking motion of the steering. But the initial movement, the initial addition of angle to create the more violent snapping is also included in that. Now, the difference between your initiation and then the point at which you slow down, the gensoku, um, is very critical. If you can accelerate after your initiation towards the gensoku, towards the point where you slow down, that's a very skillful thing to do. If your timing is absolutely correct, your gensoku point will be very, very small. The amount of braking that you're doing will be very small because the way the cars are set up with that double squat that we referred to means that you can literally continue to accelerate and slow the car down without having to actually brake or come away from the throttle. Now, one of the key things about Japanese driving is that if you drop away from the throttle and the noise of your car goes down, even just driving with your buddies, you're going to lose credibility. They're going to think you're being a bit of a pansy because you're not accelerating as hard as you can because there's more um force is more drive there's just more available in the car so the gensoku is very important because your timing has to be absolutely bang on the money or it just doesn't work what then happens is usually 
uh, now nowadays, you know, which is uh, more of the style, it's something called Ketsu Shinyu. So it's the amount of rotation that you created to go from 90 degrees beyond that and come in slightly backwards. I think that's why um, at that circuit in particular, they've done so much for knuckle development. And I think it's why something like the um, the B knuckle is so good because at that circuit, it's absolutely critical that that is correct. So you just won't make the corner properly. You come up short or you'll tuck in too early. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of ways you can cock that course up. So the final term I'd like you to learn is Chijimu, which literally means squatting um, and again referring back to the the uh, sustained squatting technique that is chijimu so the easiest way to run through all of this is that i'm now going to play some video we are going to watch a car take a run at mayhem and i'm going to show you some points <laughs> So, uh, that's been the episode this week. Um, it's quite a difficult subject matter to deal with because it's so complicated and putting it all into one concise video is very difficult. Explaining it in words is, is definitely uh, a new thing to do all at once. But uh, I've done my best, so hopefully you enjoyed this week's episode. Ultimately, you know, that's what I want is to just that we all learn a bit more together you know happy drifty friends doing happy fun drifty things together is the goal um additionally i would like to go uh, a bit more in depth about western drifting and follow that a bit more in another video but initially i wanted to cover this because i think it's a misunderstood subject um and i'm i'm just very much hoping that i um have portrayed some of the techniques which means more of you can understand it. But it boils down to this. If you want to drive like you're the king of the toge or you're at Mayhan or, uh, you know, Formula Drifter, wh wh whatever it is, set your car up that way. So my intention is, is that you understand more that the actual setup for these two things is different. So you don't end up buying products which ultimately don't deliver the driving that you want to do. If you want to drive like Nauki, Nauki uses cut knuckles, the B knuckles, and stock arms, and some wheel spacers, and it's much, much simpler to deal with. You don't necessarily need to spend a whole great deal of money to drive like a Mayhan hero. Decide what you enjoy for yourself, and then follow that path rather than trying to mix them or end up getting misinformed by people who just want to sell you stuff. Anyway, that's the end of the episode uh, I hope it did good you can like it and all that stuff if you want like that's all cool but generally like what I'd like is that you understand what I've said maybe you have an opinion on it and that you comment and you interact and we learn stuff together and this drift then keeps growing and it belongs to me and you and we can just love it forever and it's freaking awesome and I'll see you next goddamn week I'm not gonna do a weird thing I'm not going to do a weird thing. Didn't do a weird thing. Yes.